So we'll try to talk about this level. We'll see how long our voices can hold out. I'm doing a mic test for Adam to see if I'm blowing out the mic. You good, Eric? I too am doing a mic test for Adam. <laughs> Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Victorian England had a huge influence on the fashions and styles that were happening in Highland dress in Scotland. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy boys and girls, welcome to a live Kilts and Culture here at the sunny Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> we are your hosts, I am Rocky, this is Eric. Um, Yo! For those of you who don't know our general format, um, it's basically we just take questions and answer them, whether about kilts, whether about Highland culture, whether about, you know, whatever you want to ask us about. We are here, but your humble servants to answer any questions you guys have. So no. I'm I'm not a humble servant, though. I am now emperor of Celtic classics. So. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Officially, nah, I got to take this off. All right. We were at the children's tent earlier. <laughs> Eric made that one. I was the Kelpie King and uh, threatened the world to stop raining, but didn't work. All right, um, so anyone who wants to ask a question, line up. We have a mic right here. Um, so we're just gonna kind of cycle around and yes, anybody. That's how it works. Oh, no, it's gonna you. be a really, really long show if nobody asks questions. Everybody except this guy. Okay. Well, and you have to say your name. David Nyer coming to you from Columbia, Pennsylvania. Woo! I've always enjoyed all of these lovely kilt videos and everything. And I've heard you mention tartan terms and you've mentioned how, oh, we've talked about this, we've talked about that. It would be great if you could just put all those tartan terms together. Could you give us like a quick glossary of the anatomy of a tartan? You talk about things like the pivot, guards and such. Sure. Could you just go through you're, all that together? You're gonna turn this show from an hour into two hours. So. <laughs> We've got whiskey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just if, if we get too nerdy, you have to tell us just like, ah, okay, cut yeah. it out, cut it out. When, when you start seeing like people nodding off in their seats. Yeah, yes. yeah. <clears throat> um, tartan, for those who don't know, you, you should know if you're here, <laughs> is the pattern that a kilt is generally made from. Um, what he's talking about is the terms for different elements within the tartan. So the first thing I would say is, um, you have you know the stripes of the tartan you have two generally you have two pivot points so most tartan designs are symmetrical meaning if i put a mirror right there in the center of this red section on the kilt i'm wearing it's going to look the same on this side and on that side that is one of the pivots in the tartan the other pivot in this tartan is the yellow stripe right here so that's one of the terms that we use we'll talk about the set size the size of the set or the set is actually Square. the pattern. So the size of the set is from one element to where that element repeats. So in this kilt, it's you would measure it from the yellow stripe huge. to the yellow stripe. What about um, this one? This one? That's huge. It's actually a very, very large. It's a very large set. Correct. Because the yellow stripe appears every other section in the kilt. So that's like a 14 inch or 15 inch set size for that target. This is Nordic Heritage, and this is the American Dream Tartan, by the way. Yep. Um, we, did we talk about guards? No, we talked about not, pivots. Not yet. Guards. Um, guards are generally when you have a, a center stripe or a, a stripe that you want to stand out a little bit, either a white stripe or yellow stripe or something like that. So, you know, looking around, if anybody's got an example. Um, well, you can put... Sean's, Sean's kind of... <laughs> you're wearing guards. one. You, oh, okay. You can put these two really black subtle, threads. Though. Well, that's what guards are. Yeah, but they're very... Two black are, threads yeah. to go outside the yellow or outside the white, and it kind of makes it stand out. It increases the contrast for that section. Yeah, for everybody who does Photoshop, it's the drop shadow, basically, or it's the stroke on, in Photoshop. Correct. What other, no, wait. What other terminology do we um, use? You mentioned symmetrical, because then there's the asymmetrical. Oh, yep. yeah, come yep. on up. Yep, come on up. I was wondering, I, I thought I knew yes. there was a Buchanan. So, yep. stand, stand right here. So. He is wearing the lovely Buchanan weathered target. USA kilt, by the way. <laughs> Plug USA Commercial kilt. break. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at the tartan here, the main elements of the tartan are this brown 
the brown block right there, then a yellow block, then this uh, like orangish kind of block with the white stripe. If you put a, a mirror right on that white stripe, this side will look different from that side. So instead of it, you, it. <laughs> you had, had to be had different. To different, did you? Yeah. You already stand out enough. Exactly. <laughs> So this one is what's called an asymmetrical or a non-matching tartan. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, the check's in the mail. Yes. Very good. All right, thank you, David. Thank you. You guys have released two of your own um, plaids now. You have the American Dream and the Nordic Heritage. So I was curious, what is kind of the process of determining what unique or original plaid people might want on a kilt and then picking up the colors and designing what that will look like. Sure. Um, <clears throat> when Eric and I designed the Nordic Heritage Tartan, uh, we actually did a video of, we just literally said, let's design it. We'll pre-think about some of the colors, some of the inspiration we want in it um, and turn on a camera and record us and see what happens. Um, turned out pretty good. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, uh, the process for us was literally, we kind of didn't want to influence each other's original thoughts. So Eric right. said, okay, he's going to look into the different colors and things that he would want included in it. And I thought about the things I would want included in it. From there, it's every tartan is different. Every tartan designer is different. So if you're designing a tartan for your own family, for your own name, like, cause you may not have a tartan, <clears throat> you may just want to pick colors. <clears throat> you may want to pick, you know, the, a, a pink because you had a dogwood tree in your yard as a kid and you climbed it every day and broke all the branches and cracked your head on the yep. way down. Yep. Yep. It's, <clears throat> so it's every person's process, every person's meaning is different all the way up to no meaning. Just, it's just pretty colors. It's just what yeah. I wanted to do. I just wanted to have a nice pretty design and that's what I came up with. Um, I think the tartans that lend themselves more towards <sighs> Tartans lend themselves to being meaningful. It's, it is the human condition that we are seeking meaning in things. And people, you know, tartans originally way back in the day just started off as pretty patterns and just yep. something to sell to people for clothing or for cloth. Or, just, it, or just clothing your family. Yeah. You know, before there was ever a tartan industry, it was about, you know, what is mom able to weave this winter? You know, so what, what, what plants do we have growing around here that we can get dyes out of? You know, how many, you know, do we have enough wool? You know, it was it was very much subsistence survival type practical clothing. And the patterns were just whatever felt like, you know, whatever we felt like making that year. So and then from there it evolved into clan tartans. But again, there wasn't a lot of meaning within the thread count or within the colors. But over time, it just sort of <clears throat> became the natural progression where, well, we have this really cool thing that represents us. Let's imbue it, let's give it more meaning and more thought process into the design. And it's kind of, in my estimation, I'm sure yours as well, oh. it's kind of where it's just going. It's more to, as more tartans get registered and get designed, people want to find more meaning and it want to give them more meaning. Yeah, I think the, the, the bottom line is that at some point, somebody feels that this needs to exist. You know, it's an emotional draw or it's a creative draw and people just have this sense that this needs to be a real actual thing. So for instance, with the American dream one, it was the sesquicentennial. Semi-quincentennial. Se semi -quincentennial. <laughs> Coming up. The and, 250th anniversary. Right, thank you. The 250th anniversary of these here United States. And um, you felt the draw, and we felt the draw, and we knew other people did that, that basically it was worth celebrating. And we wanted to do it ahead of time, both from an emotional standpoint and frankly, a business standpoint, because there's no point in having something that marks an occasion like that if people can't have it ahead of the time of the occasion. Otherwise, you're, you're too late. Um, but we wanted to try and encapsulate some of the, you know, the big ideas of the United States into something visual. So that's and, and with the Nordic heritage, we have been asked for years by people of Scandinavian, you know, descent, at least partially that not just me, not just me. <laughs> I'm just the guy with the end, okay? But, um, you know, when are you going to do a Viking tartan? When are you going to do a Viking tartan? So that's where this one came from. So it can be it can be very small and personal, or it can be very much like, yes, this needs to exist because I am so proud of this thing. But there, it's always that emotional passion. 
is, is that's the root. That's where it really can start with. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. Uh, hi, Will O'Hare, all the way from Hartford, Connecticut. We came down to see you guys. Thank you. So I have a, I have a three part question to really keep oh, you God. guys going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, so, no, and sometimes. Thank you. Good night, go. <laughs> so you've, you've been in the kilt business for quite a while now. What trends have happily disappeared? What trends are hot right now? And what do you see coming down the pike that might be kind of fun? Trends that have disappeared. disappeared. That was never a trend. Bite your tongue. I don't want that to exist. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I think let's, I think, Will, if you don't mind, we'll morph that question a little bit. What are things that people tried to make trends that have failed? Because for the most part, once something gets caught on in the general zeitgeist of the culture, it will stick around. And the first example that comes to my mind where that is cream colored hose. People still wear cream and white colored kilt hose. They have for decades and decades and decades. So they're not going anywhere. They are less popular now, thank goodness. But I can't, I don't know, is there a trend that, I, I yes. can't think of another one. But I, no, I have another good one. Okay. Um, that I've seen less now than I did 15 years ago. Men wearing sashes. Yes, yes. So, yeah, sashes are for yep. women generally in Highland there, they're not for men. Yep. Therefore, you know, we've, you know, said that from day one. Um, trends that we would like to see, or trends that are, that are coming up, I would say people custom weaving their own tartans or no, people yeah. designing tartans that they want to exist. I think there's been a huge influx in that due to tartan, the availability of tartan designers online, yep. the availability of the, uh, the Scottish Tartan Register mm -hmm. to you know anybody, you know, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Scotland, doesn't matter. Anybody can design their own tartan and have it registered. Um, what other trends would you say? Um, I think it's about the tweeds. I mean, you're already seeing this. I think that's going to be here for a while. Basically, um, like your your kilt's a really good example, actually. Um, tweed and tartan cloth that looks tweedy has become more of a thing lately. And that's due to a couple of things. Basically, the uh, the Outlander effect a little bit. And also the, uh, like, you, you like to call it the pinky blinder. Pinky blinders. Pinky blinders, effect. yep. Basically, people wanting stuff that feels more old timey, more vintage, retro, however you want to put it, um, a bit more earthy. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. I think it's going to keep going. Um, yeah, that's yeah. that's probably the biggest trend. Yeah. Bad, one other bad trend that never took off, which I'm really glad it was kilts on the bias, where instead of the tartan going this way, going like that, okay, crisscross. There were a couple of different vendors a few years ago who were trying to get, get that to stick. Uh, especially as a fashion option for people over in Scotland, because a lot of time they don't they don't wear kilts except for things like weddings. Okay, so the industry is trying to cater to people over there who want something that's trendy for their wedding. And for a while, they were trying to do this. Yeah, it's cool now, kids. You know, and it's bloody awful. Yeah, it's a dog's breakfast, as you would say. Yes, but, indeed. Yeah, that's I. What else? I agree. I think the marled yarns. Yep. Um, uh, lock oh no, we're trendy. <laughs> we fell for it. We did it. No, no. I think it's going uh, to be a thing. Yeah. The uh, uh, Lock Karen and Martin Mills both started do two mills over in the UK started doing tweed tartans a few years ago, and then House of Edgar, uh, which is another a different mill, came up with a whole collection using marled yarns. Marled meaning taking two shades of gray, twisting it twisting together, it and that becomes a, a scratchy, earthy kind of look. It's not actual scratchy, but just looks scratchy visually. Um, and that's, it, it, when done well, it's chef's kiss, it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I think that one's gonna stick around for a while. Now, now what, what is a trend, what is the third part? Was a trend you'd like to see? Wait, it was you. What do you see coming down the pipe? Like, see, okay, coming yeah. down, the, that's, that's what, so I was doing a current one. Something that we think that hasn't happened yet, you're gonna use your crystal ball. I, the, the marled yarns is probably the one, I don't see anything like okay. out off the horizon. The marled yarns are probably the thing that is, <clears throat> it's taken off in the rental industry in Scotland, um, the, the higher industry. So, and then you know, a, a lot of people, they, uh, House of Eggers started doing some clan tartans with marled yarns. So I think that's gonna be the next palette. I'm, I got is it. marled yarns. I got it. Um, I think the next big trend will be different jackets. I think that the 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 Sheriff Muir and Montrose Double, things like that, are going to take off 
Retro. And, and, yeah. yeah, again, retro and more 18th century Regency period looking fashions are probably going to start to gain more and more popularity. Because you know you, we're too used to seeing Argyle jackets and Prince Charlie's on your average wedding outfits or your average bands or, or solo pipers doing a gig. And it's starting to feel like, eh, you know, and people don't want their dad's Oldsmobile. So I think I think that's going to be the next thing. And then there's the whole great kilt factor. So, yeah. It was Mantra's named, jacket. It's a yeah, style it was of named jacket. after him. Yeah. It looks more. It looks kind of like a bib shirt. It's basically a. It's like two sets of buttons oh, right, right. going down the sides and a tall collar. So. Yep. I'll present our visual aid. Uh, I can't. Never mind. Right. He didn't show up. I did. Yeah. Can't find good help. Ross, yeah. you mentioned the registry. How does that process work to, to register a tartan? To register a tartan, you just need, you know, basically a thread count, meaning the, you know. It's, the thread count is the the order and sequence of threads, the color and the number of threads, and you need that, and you need money. <laughs> you submit yeah. it to the Tartan Register. It's not. It's like 150 bucks, 100 bucks, something in there. Um, you submit it to the Tartan Register as long as they don't disapprove of the name and the design is original. Yeah. They, you know, a couple weeks later they say, "Here you go, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. You're blessed. You get your own tartan." They literally say that too. Yes, it's in the it's yeah. in the subject line of the email. Ha Hanika Danica is actually Danica. Gallic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's Latin. Yeah, from the oh, you're, uh, our I'm blessings. Sorry. You're yes. right. It's yeah. Mm, depends on if you restrict it within the register. Yes. Yeah. What is tartan? What if I wanted to create a weathered human tartan because there ain't one? How would that the, work? <clears throat> a weathered uh, to create a weathered human tartan, you you don't. Correct, but it, you're not changing it. You're changing the color palette. A green Toyota Corolla and a blue Toyota Corolla are both Toyota Corollas, just different colors. Yep. So a weathered Hume Tartan could exist. You just have to find a mill that would weave it for you and you know give them money and they will. Not on the registry, but would I have to go for the plan on the But that no, because no. it's it, it's not going to be on the registry because it's the same Tartan. Doesn't it's need the to same be. set. It's the same thread count. It's just a different shade of blue, a different shade of green. Yep. So if anybody ever tells you that the ancient version of your clan tartan is more official than the modern version of your tartan, nope. that's BS. That's not true. Those are all, yep. those are just fashion options. How do we go about getting something woven from a particular person, like discontinued tartan? You mean how, how you can get a custom, a tartan custom woven there for you? you? Go, yeah. Well, sure. you find somebody who's a reputable kilt and tartan purveyor, of which there are... <laughs> um, Basically, it, that is a business arrangement you set up with a mill, and usually someone who is, a, frankly, a middleman in a sense, like us, figure out what mill is going to be capable of doing it based on a number of factors, make sure that the color palette is where you want it, make sure the threads, you know, like, well, they wanted their blue to be a little darker blue, blah, 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 House of Edgar has a better blue for this and this, blah, 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 and then set it up. The key, am I wrong so far, are we good? You forgot the first part, but I'll get back to it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the key is going to be uh, the cost, because basically um, the, the, the less yardage you're asking to have woven, the more it's going to cost. So if you have a group of people, you know, just basic laws of economics, if you have a group, a club, an extended family, you get everybody to pool their interests and you know you have a, a, an audience for it, then the cost is going to come down. How, how do you, how do you get the, like, how do you, how do you ask them how to get in contact with them? Yes. How yeah. do you do that? And the, what's the process? I sure. guess is what my question Say hi. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. you know, so write them an email. Sometimes it has to be more of official communication. On, okay. But. On the Tartan register, the when you register a Tartan, you also are asked to give your contact details. Okay. Because if someone else wants to weave that Tartan, they want to get in touch with you to be able to get permission to weave the Tartan. Now, some Tartans are restricted where people say that I'm designing this tartan for, for my family, me and my sisters, and that's it. And no one else, I don't want anyone else to have this. Right. They could put a restriction in when they register the tartan saying, you know, it's, it's restricted. I don't want anyone else to do it. In the case of the continued tartan, he wanted other people to be able to wear it, to raise awareness for suicide, you know, suicide prevention. Right. So that is one where, but he is controlling it because he wants a certain percentage of it to okay. go to charity for mm -hmm. suicide awareness. So when we did that with him, it was, you know, we gave a percentage of the sales to a charity okay. based on that. And it was in, in collaboration with him. Once you get permission from them, 
then the, the registrar will give you the thread count or give us the thread count or whoever, and then yep. you just have it woven, bada bing, you got your stuff. Okay, thank you. Cool. Sure. Bill Nash from north of Detroit. Um, I'm thank a you for coming out. Wow. Yes. I'm a fair weather kilter, so. Uh, <laughs> In Detroit? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I Here. think I'd come to a place that has worse weather. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, this question is in regards to kilt belts. I've noticed a couple different styles. Uh, the, the latest is Velcro, but I've also seen the internal strap and wonder the difference between the, the benefits and drawbacks of both. Sure. And then also on the Velcro, it doubles the width of the, the thickness of the belt. And is that part of the reason the bulk pops out on the on the one side? Understood. Um, the Way back when we first started in business, back in my day. Are you wearing a belt? Uh, yes. Okay. Stealth. Um, when we first started in business, we got, you know, we ordered kilt belts from some of our suppliers and they have an internal buckle. So, uh, here. The inside <laughs> is all coming off. Now you have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the OnlyFans channel that's later. Sorry, mom. <laughs> so, what he's talking about is a kilt belt is attached from the back. You know, and it has either Velcro on the yep. inside or this tapers to you a small see. belt on the inside. Then there's a little buckle on the inside. When we first started getting kilt belts, it had this small buckle on the inside. And it scared the hell out of me because that little buckle, if there's any burr on, this, on the swing arm on the buckle, that's resting on your kilt. And I didn't want to be responsible for wrecking somebody's kilt, especially a $500 kilt. So yep. I just kind of made the executive decision way back then. Nope, we are just going to do, you know, Velcro belts. You can get either or. So that's always the style that we carried. Um, for the back of the buckle, it's your kilt belt buckle. If you're looking down, always sits a little, you know, can't a little squint because on the back of the buckle, <laughs> stripping down again. That's oh, the sequel. Right. <laughs> you have a small bridge that the leather goes through. And then you have a little hook on the other side. So the bridge, you have Make sure leather. Make these people can see. There we go. You have the leather stacking up on top of the bridge. And on the other side, you just have a little D-ring. And that fits snugly underneath there. So it's this side is thinner than this side. This side also has two layers. This side has one layer. So it's going to sit a little off on the front of you. But it's kind of, it is what it is. It's a known flaw within it. What we did was we actually had our hooks moved in a little bit to try to you know, make sure that the edge of the buckle is hitting the, the full layer of leather and that kind of thing. But there's always going to be some layer or some level of it being a touch off, but it's not something that you know, affects yeah. too many people or too many people are too concerned about after you just kind of go, okay, that's what it is. Um, the one interesting thing I think about kilt belts, First, do you have anything to add to that? Talk? Yes. I'll probably go on for a while. Maybe you should get yours over with. Okay. <laughs> the one interesting thing about kilt belts is there's no standardization of right side up or wrong side up. Yeah. So <clears throat> some some kilt belts you get, you wrap around, you know, the way you do your regular jeans belt in America. Others you wrap around the other direction or else you look down and it's upside down. <clears throat> Sorry. No, I was just going to say that basically the uh, the internal buckle is the older technology. Um, I'd say at this point, the vast majority of belts out there are the Velcro. Uh, I actually prefer it because it is more adjustable. And I own several kilts. Some of them are different thicknesses, but I can still use the same belt uh, with those kilts because I can just I can I can adjust it even just by millimeters if I want to, based on the size of the buckle and the thickness of the of the kilts at the waist, all that. So. I like it, and I've had belts for many, many, many years, and I've never had a problem with the Velcro. So, you know, I think what you're illustrating, though, is the fact that even though we're talking about a traditional national dress that has been in some way set in stone for the past 120, 150 years, the technology still changes. Like, for instance, Mr. Barr here is wearing a dress for him. Could you come up here real quick? <laughs> come on, old man. Yay! Right. Come on, David. Now, you didn't know there was audience participation, yeah. did you? That's what you get for sitting in the front row. Okay. Now, this is the this is a dress sporin. 
one of the things we'll tell you about dress worms is that the identifier is that it has a cantle, which is the metal piece at the top, which was the closure. Back in the day, that was actually a hinged purse-like clasp. Like if you know any, any women here who have a handbag, you know, a with a you know, that's yeah, a pinch close like that. But now open your sporn for me. Now you'll observe this snap is actually what's doing all the work now. This is how pretty much most, if not all, dress sporns are made nowadays because the manufacturers very quickly realized this was more efficient, less prone to problems, and less easier, expensive. And less expensive, and you could do more with it artistically if you just made this front piece purely decorative. So the snap goes around to the back of the back flap of the sporn. That's an example of an innovation that's come along. It's preserving the tradition and the look, but it's making a small technical improvement. And so the Velcro on the belt is kind of the same deal. Yeah. So there's just little things that get tweaked over time as technology and life progress. Let so, me jump in for one it. sec. And, sure, jump away. And while we're staring at his crotch, the, <laughs> and uh, talking about the hinged cantles that were on older style Sporn, the ball on the top of the cantle serves zero purpose now. That was originally like basically a pinball that you would pull up and yep. that's how the hinge would open and close is from that. Now it's just decorative, that's it. Yep. Cool, thank you, David. Uh, uh, one, other, one other question on the belt, the, the loops. Essentially, it helps to keep the leather, you know, to, when you're folding oh. over leather, it's helping to keep it flat. Yeah. Um, another thing you can use it for, if you want to use it for, if you're a sanguine gentleman um, with a little bit of a belly in the front, yeah. um, I found that you can put your sporin chain through them on either side to help your sporin stay centered and lower or yeah. and not kind of that's, underline the belly. That's what they were originally for. I think is what Possibly. we figured out. Is that based? Probably that's, non that's why I have two of them. A non-Velcro belt, I could understand why you'd have those. But right. Yep. Very good, yep. thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. Matt Jeffers uh, from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, my question is, restricted coat, the Balmoral, how restricted is it? Extremely. Nope. Yes. Don't <clears throat> even think about it. Is there a kilt police? Yes. Yes. The mills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, so the Balmoral tartan is the, the tartan of the King and Queen of Scotland, uh, or the royal family. Royal family. Yes. Um, it is essentially gray. It's a few shades of gray with a red stripe, I think. Yeah. Um, it is a design that was, who, who was the one that... Uh, Yes, to have I knew you were gonna. I knew you were gonna ask me this, and I insert name here. Uh, no, it was uh, uh, it was the Prince Consort. It was Albert. Okay. It was Albert. So, <clears throat> it was designed a hundred years ago. Oh no, more than that. It was back in the eighteen fifties. Eighteen. Yeah. That because, long ago. Yeah. Okay. Prince Albert designed okay. the Balmoral Tartan. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's like my yeah. bad. <laughs> so anyway, it is one that is reserved for the royal family. If you. If you were so inclined and wove your own material, then sure, you could do it. Okay. Um, the, uh, but at the same time, it's none of the mills in Scotland would do it. Even if I went to House of Edgar and said, hey, I have this nice uh, gray chart I want to do. Here's a threat count. Just go ahead and do this. They'd be like, yeah, no, we won't do it. Um, out of respect for the, the monarchy. Um, yes, so you could... You could do it, but as Groucho Marx once said, you know, I would never belong to a club that would have me as a member. Um, I don't know if I would. Cool. Also yeah. wanted to say uh, thank you for the community of Kilton culture that you guys have yeah. cultivated. And thank show you. of hands of how many people are actually here from that group. So, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, how many yeah. people here are on the Kilton culture Facebook group? Jeez. Cool. Uh, nice. Nice. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you can, with other restricted tartans, sometimes there is some wiggle room. But the, the Balmoral tartan specifically was developed because too many people were using the Royal Stuart tartan. And actually, George VI tried to get people to stop, and they wouldn't. So, you know, that, that, that whole, that just... The horse had left yeah, the barn. Yeah, that had long, before he was born, that horse had left the barn. So Balmoral is basically it. Now, if you want something that has a kind of a royal connection... Uh, for some reason, and I know we all have different opinions about the Brits, you know, the, well, the, the English and the monarchy, but um, I'd recommend doing uh, Holyrood. That is, that is a very much a, a monarchy-related tartan. It's beautiful, uh, and it's universal. Anybody can wear it. Yep. So. Hello! I'm Liz from Pittsburgh, so hi. hi. Um, so this nice gentleman over here asked questions earlier about trends for kilts in particular. 
I know. Ladies do not wear kilts. We wear kilted skirts. Thank you very much. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> Asterisk. The and times like they are changing. On that. But um, likewise, what are the trends that you have seen for the ladies that have gone by the wayside? What would you like to see as far as trends? So basically the same question. Sure. The Is this going on my dating profile or is this? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, the, I would honestly say um, the, the trend would be away from kilted skirts and more towards yeah. A, yeah. a, a knee length type garment. So while women you know, traditionally would wear kilts below the knee as a kilted skirt or to the ankle as a, uh, a hostess skirt, um, women more and more wear either mi mini kilts or uh, midi like to the knee or just a little bit below the knee yep. and more of an A-line shape a little bit more casually versus something just reserved for formal. Basically, they're, right. you know, the, at least uh, you know, in our experience and here in America, um, you know, all the men are having fun going to Celtic festivals, going out to the pub, wearing cool, casual, you know, kilts in casual context. And women are like, I want to do it too. So they're just kind of saying, all right, well, we're going to do it. You know, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Um, so they're just kind of incorporating it into the way that they want to you know, play with it as fashion while having its own symbolism and the heritage wrapped up in the actual tartan itself. Yeah. Man. Please. So, that's why I um, look at you. That's I think that I think that basically women's Highland fashion kind of ossified for a long time. Uh, it kind of became it went to a nadir in most of the 20th century, where it's like, well, this is what you are supposed to wear, and you're only going to be wearing it for a special occasion. Therefore, it is a kilted skirt, which is very straight, and a sash, okay, and maybe a shawl. So what we've seen over the past 10, 20, even 25 years, but especially now, is just more is more. Um, I mean, you're more and more used to seeing fashion designers using tartan for things, and that's always been there. But the idea of, for instance, uh, do you really have to wear white for a wedding? No, there are tartan wedding gowns now. Um, do you want to have more options that are more flattering and easier to wear than a formal kilted skirt? Absolutely. So it's kind of, in that sense, the industry is finally catching up, and they're just, it's more is more is more is more. So it's, it's nowhere but up as far as the women's fashion is concerned. Um, is there anything that should be brought back? Eh, I'm a big hoop skirt fan, but you know, <laughs> that's probably a bit extreme. I'm more of a uh, poodle skirt guy. <laughs> yeah, poodle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kristen Dior could do tartan, you know, Fair. but um, yeah, that's basically it, yeah. Oh, you, uh, you come with music. You yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm ours, what can you, I say? We gotta do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, all the way from Ewing, New Jersey. Um, what color would you like to see more tartans made? Personally, I'd vote for more purple. There's just not enough. <laughs> what color would we like to see more in tartans? <laughs> Ultraviolet green. Because <laughs> I'm a club kid, so yeah, I want I want UV reactive tartans. <laughs> but I'm, I'm only half joking. I think I'm, I'm waiting for that to happen. You know, but. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't think there's, there's a particular there's color. color. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. I would say marled yarns, like marled grays, yeah. and adding a different level to it. The color palette, the rainbow, is kind of you know the rainbow. There's you know you can have anything dyed in any color. Um, personally, I like the range that is kind of settled on within the industry as far as modern, weathered, muted, ancient. Um, but I like playing around and doing th little things that are different within it. I've said multiple times, I like having two of the same color in a tartan. So for instance, this one, I actually mm -hmm. have three shades of blue and three shades of red. I love the, the, the different layering effect that that gives to it. Marled yarns give it a different layering kind of effect. So I, I wouldn't say any particular color, but shades <sighs> of a color to give more of a spectrum with a color. I'll, 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 I'll say pink. I think pink could be cool. Pink could be cool. Yeah. But yeah, why not? But yeah, in purple, it's like you're either a purple person or you're not. Yeah. It's always kind of been there, but it's also some people either love it or hate it is the impression we have. But now how, how show of hands. What if there was a metallic thread in a tartan, like a gold, like metallic thread in tartan now? Everybody who has their hand raised has to get out. Get out. I will fight you. Yep. 
I think, it, you know, at some point somebody will do it. It's human nature. If it can be done, at some point nobody do it. It's just, yeah. People, no, okay, here you go. That absolute black, that dead black oh, that yeah. absorbs all light that goes into yep. it. Yep, that. That would be wild. That would be badass. Yep. Now, not as a kilt, because it would look like you're just walking around naked with the black bar in real life. <laughs> but, but having something like that um, to add like a layer of contrast, a deeper contrast would be pretty awesome. Yep. Cool. Mix that with some metallic. There you go. I, I, I like it to point out that- It would absorb the light from the metallic, so yes. I'd like to point out that the gentleman who asked that question is actually wearing a solid color kilt. Nice I'm, assuming, I'm assuming most people know this, but that is that is a saffron kilt. That Mona. is the the probably second most traditional Irish kilt you can wear. So kudos to you for that. Um, yep. So there you go. Yep. So other than my question, other than St. Patrick's Day and Celtic Fest, what are good occasions to wear a kilt? Every day. Every day that ends in Y. You you knew we were gonna say that. You knew we were gonna say that. Yeah. I will. I let. Do you have a? You want no, no, go ahead. Play go ahead. around with this. Nope. Go I will say. No. Is there anybody here who does not own a kilt? Good. That's okay. The right answer. All right. Well, then we don't need to worry about that. Um, one thing you can tell your friends who are new to it is, um, if you're just starting out, these are the best places to start. You know, you're among friends. You're in a supportive culture environment. So festivals, renaissance fairs, or special occasions like holidays are always good for getting started. So if you, if you run into somebody who's, yeah, who's, who's nervous about wearing a kilt for the first time, tell them to do that and offer to go with them. You know, if you wear a kilt and you love kilts, then be, be somebody who's kilt wing person, whatever, you know, but um, yeah. Yes. It's like, I, I, would say, I would say, you know, start with the holidays and then work your way out. If you're trying to build a kilt habit, start with festivals, start with, St. Andrew's Day, start with a burn supper, start with Christmas, Tartan. National Tartan Week, week, week. And, then, uh, and then and just build the habit out from there if, if you're looking for some kind of a, a lifestyle approach. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's all. Just and the other thing to tell that person, it is a mental curb this high to get over. Uh, yeah. Once you wear a kilt, it's, it's, it's that weird, scary, like, oh my God, I feel like I'm wearing a bath towel out in public and people are gonna look at me like, yeah, they are, because yeah. you're better than them. <laughs> So, so, for, but, but once you wear it out in public, as all of you know, if you look back at it the next day, like, what the hell was I so concerned about? Why was I so worried about this? It's yeah. just about getting out of your shell and not giving a damn what anyone else thinks of you. Yep. Very much. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's no reason not to wear a kilt. In 2023, people wear whatever the hell they want to wear all the time. So there's no reason not to wear a kilt. There's no reason not to enjoy your heritage. There's no reason not to share it with the rest of the world. Yep. Whether they like In it or not. In a polite, respectful way, <laughs> yeah, polite whether they way. want to or not. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Any other questions? I got one. Sure. So sure. Adam, give him, um, throw the mic at him. Both, you both show a joy of conveying the history and culture. Eric in particular, you seem to love getting into the deep dives of things. I'm a nerd. Uh, well, I was gonna say, were you a history major? Did you do any? <laughs> English and anthropology. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You, you really and seem was, you enjoy conveying. My, my father was a history teacher and my uncle was an uh, archeologist. Okay. So it kind of, the nerddom <clears throat> runs in the family. So yeah, I was just raised in being a fogey and a nerd. I like, I, I've, I've gotten more into some layers of history. I'm not into everything as Eric is, um, but I like specific moments in time and I like how seeing how this affects this affects this, like the knock on domino effect. Yeah. Um, one thing that we're considering uh, publicly, I'll say it now, one thing we're considering for a, uh, uh, a haggis hunting you know, podcast episode is if we do a what if thing, what if this domino didn't fall, how would that have affected the rest right. of, you know, kilt wearing through time or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, or Celtic culture in general. Yes, you know, like, or Celtic culture. What if Culloden yeah. never happened? Yes. Okay, you know. Whoa. Yeah, or what? Yeah. Exactly. What exactly. If, what if you guys got to reach out to Brian Foogie? What if Scott and everybody <laughs> thought King George coming to stop? Yep, yep, 
Yep. 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 That was. Yeah. What if, what if what if what if Sir Walter Scott got run over by a train? You know. <laughs> oh, it's one of those new steam gadgets I've heard so much about. And bam. You know. So. It depends on how easily you fall asleep. Um, Where I, do you start out for history? If you want to find, book, yeah, a book, yeah. A, a book. What are some good books for book yeah history? She's yep. on the mic. Like, I think she's projecting enough. He'll pick it up. But okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, as I said before, here we gotta do this for the recording. So everybody pretend I said the joke for the first time. It depends on how easily you fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wish I had audience control like that. Damn. <laughs> the uh, the the current really really respected book right now is Scotland: The Story of a Nation. Um, it's Magnus Magnuson, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I because so, yeah. of course a Norse guy does an Icelander does a history of Scotland. I have no bias whatsoever. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, the uh, what I usually recommend though is that's like this thick. Okay, that's a big big book. Um, for those who are interested in military history, I highly recommend using the Osprey books or Men at Arms books as a gateway drug. How many people here own an Osprey book? I got 1,200. Uh, holy cow. What, do you own stock in the company or something? <laughs> Damn, son. Um, they are, they are, they are a great library. They're a great gateway reading. Um, their shorter books, smaller books are usually biographies or a specific period in time. So. Pick up a book on William Wallace. Pick up a book on, you know, on the Battle of Culloden. You know, just something like that, and 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 start there. Um, another cool thing, if you're more of a novel reader, is read period stories, not necessarily modern fictional historical fiction, because they tend to get weird with the details. They will invent things if they need to fill in the gaps. See, they're not always trustworthy. Um, the uh, the, yeah. The, the exception of those being the Flashman books, if anybody's ever read those, those are amazing, but um, they're not Scottish. But uh, read Waverly, you know, read, read Sir Walter Scott. Read books, yeah, books yeah. by Sir Walter Scott. Yeah, books from yeah. the time period. You will not necessarily get the historical sense, but you'll get the sense of how people thought, because that's how he thought at the time he wrote the book. So that's, that's basically it. I mean, the, the thick one is good if you take it in chunks, or like I said, if you need a sleep aid, you know, it's good. But that's, that would be my basic advice. Sure. That's a great question. It's yeah. the kind of question I like. Cool. Well, you're talking about uses of kilts. Actually, a friend of mine says that one of the best things that ever he came up with was he would wear his kilt with no shirt and nothing else and vacuum before his wife came home from work. <laughs> and she would always jump his bones. <laughs> she said she never saw anything so sexy as a guy wearing a kilt pushing a vacuum cleaner. Are you sure that's not just a meme? <laughs> no, no, no. True truth. Truth. Let me let me ask a question. Let my, me, what? my wife would look at me and be like, "What the hell did you do?" <laughs> yeah. Why and what? Yeah, yeah I, I, for for my wife it'd just be, "Oh, it's a Thursday," you know. It's just not, but but, or it, or it, it's August. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me just real quick, for for the women in the audience, is the it, is it the confidence? That makes a guy wearing wearing a kilt sexy. Raise your hand. Okay. It, or is it the physique? Is it the is it the perception of possible easy access? I hope no. Please no. Okay. Is it both? Okay. Okay. So yeah, it does work. It is true. Yep. Sometimes. Sometimes. So unbiased results from the women get a kilt. Yes. Indeed. Cool. Best marketing campaign ever. Indeed. Indeed. All right, everyone, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, we're going to be hanging out here as long as the pipe band doesn't show up and kick us out of this tent. The people that are on after us aren't going to be here. So we're going to hang out and just kind of chill out under a tent and uh, knock back a uh, sippy sip or two. So cheers. There you go. Thank you. And it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. We have to do the official One, ending. Two. Oh, and, yeah. OK, we got, we got yeah. end the show. Okay. And until next time, boys and girls. Sanjava, I don't have a drink. <laughs>
Until next year. Dee ba dee ba dee ba dee ba dee. That's all, folks.